Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks written by Al Lewis. Well, it's always pleasant to welcome back a friend who's been away. That's why our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, was happy to be on her way to school a bit earlier than usual last Friday morning. Yes, last Friday, Mr. Boynton was due back from a biologist convention, which had lasted for three weeks. I had heard from him during his absence, of course. In fact, he sent me one passionate postcard after another. Two altogether. <laughs> but shy or not, a man is a man. Or as the French would say, c'est la vie, c'est l'amour, which means a man is a man. <laughs> That's why I had Walter Denton pick me up so early last Friday. I hope we get to school before Mr. Boynton does, Walter. Oh, we will, Miss Brooks. This little old buggy will have you down to school in nothing flat. I'll settle for with nothing flat. <laughs> It'll feel rather strange seeing Mr. Boynton again. I wonder how he'll seem to me after being away so long. Oh, he probably hasn't changed any. Just a big, tall, dark-haired, good-looking guy with a sparkling smile and a throbbing voice. Yeah, who needs him? <laughs> he sure is attractive to girls. If it wasn't for the fact that she's so daffy in love with me, even Harriet Conklin would go for him. Harriet? But she's only a young girl. Is there an age limit? <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> And I took Harriet to the movies last night. We saw Humphrey Bogart to Tokyo Joe. And after the picture, we both got the same thought at the same time. How much Mr. Boynton reminded us of Bogey. Mr. Boynton reminded you of Bogey? Well, sure, Miss Brooks. You see, in the picture, Bogey goes back to Japan after the war and finds out that the wife whom he thought was dead isn't. And boy, what he goes through to get that wife back. And that's what made us think of Mr. Boynton. What? He goes through almost as much not to get a wife. <laughs> Present company included. But I must admit I'm looking forward to seeing him again. Me too. In fact, I'm bringing him a little gift this morning. It was Harriet Conklin's idea. We were having lunch yesterday in the school cafeteria, and she suggested that we all show him how glad we are he's home in a concrete way. What are you getting him, a building? <laughs> no, ma'am. No, we're all getting something different. Miss Enright happened to be at the table when Harriet mentioned it, and she got all excited about the idea. She would. Oh, I forgot. You're not overly fond of Miss Enright, are you? I've got nothing against her, Walter. She's a very good English teacher. She speaks very highly of you, Miss Brooks. In fact, just yesterday, she paid you a very nice compliment. Miss Enright did? Sure. She said you put even more effort into teaching than the job needed. And then she said she thought it was a miracle, considering how monotonous your existence is, that you don't look even grimmer than you do. <laughs> and to think, she never used to like me. <laughs> of course, she does consider you quite a rival for Mr. Boynton's affections. That's why she'll probably get him some real expensive gift. Her parents are quite wealthy, you know. Yes, I know they are, but mine aren't. So as much as I'd like to get Mr. Boynton a little welcome home present, I'm afraid it's out of the question. Although I suppose I could cut off all my hair and sell it for enough money to buy him a nice watch chain. <laughs> no, he's probably pawned his watch to get me a new comb. <laughs> Say, that'd make a swell short story, Miss Brooks. Thanks. I'll submit it to O. Henry in the morning. <laughs> Here's what I'm giving Mr. Boynton. It's right in this paper bag. Want to take a look at it? All right, Walter. Oh, it's a tie. Wow, pretty loud, isn't it? It's a very original design, Miss Brooks. Tell me, what does it look like to you? Let's see. Well, to me, it looks like a big yellow tree on a cliff by the ocean with a purple owl on top of it playing a bugle. <laughs> That's exactly right, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Stretch Snodgrass gave it to me last Christmas. You see, I'm broke, too, and since I never had the gut... The courage to wear it. <laughs> See, I figured I might as well give it to Mr. Boynton. Gosh, I hope he has the good, the courage to wear it. <laughs> well, it is a fairly grotesque little number, Walter, but after all, it isn't the gift itself which matters. It's the spirit with which you foist it on someone. <laughs> Well, here's 
the biology lab, Miss Brooks. Shall we go in and welcome back our hero together? If our hero has arrived, it might be a nice idea, but first I... Look, look who just came out of the lab, Miss Enright. Good morning, Walter. Hiya, Miss Enright. And dear Miss Brooks, I hate to be the bearer of such evil tidings, but your quarry hasn't been sighted yet. My quarry? You were here when I arrived, remember? Well, I just wanted to leave a little welcome home gift to Mr. Boynton. I assure you I haven't spent two seconds hanging around this door. Oh, I'm sure you haven't, Miss Enright, but tell me one thing. Did you sleep with your paws over the threshold or under the threshold? <laughs> Excuse me, ladies, but I'm going to leave my little gift on Mr. Boynton's desk, too. Well, Miss Brooks... I suppose you're waiting to deliver your humble little offering to Mr. Boynton in person. No, Miss Enright, to be perfectly honest with you. Please, Miss Brooks, it's a little early in the morning for fantasy. <laughs> but even if you were going to tell me that you haven't bought anything for Mr. Boynton, I assure you that your method of spreading the welcome mat is very effective. What do you mean? Well, you're wearing it, aren't you? <laughs> really, I don't mean to criticize your get-up, my dear I realize that on a teacher's salary, dressing well takes more than good taste Even if you had any <laughs> I don't have to depend on my earnings to get along Mama and Papa have always been extremely well off They didn't know how well off till you were born <laughs> I'd better be on my way. I can't afford to engage in a common hair-pulling contest. Not when you get your hair at I.J. Fox, you can't. <laughs> now, see here, Miss Enright, let's... Well, I left my present on one of the lab tables so he doesn't miss it. Gee, that's a pretty big box you left on his desk, Miss Enright. What's in it? It's an imported suede jacket, Walter. And if you'll excuse me now, Miss Brooks... I'll let my gift make my welcome speech for me. I'm going to freshen up a bit. If I were you, darling, I'd do the same thing. If I were you, so would I. <laughs> oh, well, this is great. All I've got for Mr. Boynton's homecoming is a big, fat, empty handshake. Don't you believe it, Miss Brooks. I wouldn't let you be caught in a predicament like that. That's why I made out a card saying to Philip Boynton from Constance Brooks and put it in the bag with that tie I got from Stretch Snodgrass. That tie? Well, it was very considerate of you, Walter, but alongside of Miss Enright's jacket, that tie is bound to suffer. In fact, it looks like it's suffering by itself. <laughs> well, I did think of that, Miss Brooks. I'm sorry, Walter. I just can't accept your favor. Yeah, but Miss Brooks... I'm sorry. I've got to hurry into the lab and get that tie before Mr. Boynton lays eyes on it. I'd be embarrassed to death if he thought oh, that hello, I... hello, Miss Brooks. You're looking for me? Why, Mr. Boynton, I didn't know you were back. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, Walter. Uh, let's go into the lab, huh? Okay, Mr. Boynton. Uh, the lab? Not yet. Uh, don't you think you ought to say hello to our principal, Mr. Conklin? Oh, I just left his office. I brought him a little souvenir from the biologist convention. Oh, it was quite a meeting, Miss Brooks. Come on in the lab for a minute. I want to talk to you. Well, let's go in, Miss Brooks. Everything will be all right. Oh, but that tie with the owl... Oh, it's good to get back, all right. Same old blackboard, same lab tables, equipment, and... Say, well, what's this little bag? Open it, why don't you? Maybe it's a present from someone. A <laughs> uh, present? Oh, it's a tie. Ah! <laughs> what happened? Did the tree fall off the cliff? <laughs> Wait a minute. This is identical to the tie I gave Stretch Snodgrass last Christmas. You gave it to Stretch? It certainly gets around. <laughs> I, I remember it very well. I thought it was all right to give to a young kid, but... Uh, oh, here's a card that came with it. Don't read it. Oh, that's okay, Miss Brooks. Let him read it. Hmm, it says, to Philip Boynton from Daisy Enright. Daisy Enright? But look at that big box on your desk, Mr. Boynton. Why don't you go over and open that? But, uh, another package? What is this? Anyway, let's take a look at this situation. That's what I tried to tell you in the hall, Miss Brooks. I figured the tie would look like nothing next to Miss Enright's gift, so I switched the card. What? Well, this is a surprise. Oh, what a beautiful suede jacket. Miss Brooks, you shouldn't have done it. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Boynton, I, uh, Walter here... I've got to go I... now. Still a little hard. Walter, Walter. 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 Come on, glad you're back. Walter. Well, Miss Brooks, 
Well, this convinces me of something I've always felt to be true, that your sensibilities, your, your generous nature... Oh, look, Mr. Boynton, I just... Well, now, just comparing this exquisite jacket with that ridiculous tie of Miss Enright's, it's just, just overwhelming. You like the jacket, huh? <laughs> no, it's, it's the most wonderful gift I've ever received. Now, I did plan to stay home tonight and catch up on some work, but this, this lovely gift changes all that. Miss Brooks, I... Uh, if I may, well, uh, I'd like a date tonight. You would? How about dinner, Mr. Boynton? Oh, it's a splendid idea, Miss Brooks. What are you having at your house? <laughs> you, now. <laughs> oh, good. A and let's have lunch together, too. Fine. The lunch will be on me. I wouldn't have it any other way. Me either. <laughs> well, heads bell for class, Miss Brooks. Yes, I'd better get going, but, Mr. Boynton, I'd appreciate it if you'd help me to the door. Help you? Yes. I want to be sure I don't trip over my conscience. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. E eminent dental authorities supervised hundreds of college men and women for over two years. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate's right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate dental cream as directed, using Colgate's exclusively, showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research indicates decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst after meals or snacks. When you brush your teeth with Colgate's right after eating, you help remove acids before they can harm enamel. Yes, Colgate's contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. And remember, Colgate's cleans your breath while it cleans your teeth. Always use Colgate Dental Cream right after eating to help prevent new cavities, help stop tooth decay before it starts. Well, when lunchtime arrived, I hurried toward the cafeteria to keep my date with Mr. Boynton. But as I passed the principal's office, Mr. Conklin's daughter, Harriet, bounded toward me from behind a potted plant. Hi, Miss Brooks. Daddy wants to see you before you go to lunch. Naturally. But before you go in, I've got some wonderful news for you. What do you think I just found? Miss Enright lying at the foot of a stairway. <laughs> no, I've discovered the most devastating welcome home gift for Mr. Boynton. I got it in a store around the corner. Here, I'll open it for you. It's a hand-painted silk handkerchief, Miss Brooks. Look at it. Well, what does the pattern look like to you? To me, it looks like a big yellow tree on a cliff by the ocean with a purple owl on top of it playing a bugle. <laughs> That's exactly right. Isn't it the end? I hope so. <laughs> it was part of the set, but I couldn't afford the extra 65 cents for the tie that went with it. Don't let that worry you, Harriet. Maybe Mr. Boynton will just happen to have a tie with a yellow tree and an owl on it. And did you notice this, Miss Brooks? Right under the yellow tree on one of the green branches is the initial B. Get it? B for Boynton. Or bilious. <laughs> it's really very pretty, Harriet, and I'm sure Mr. Boynton will love every twig of it, but I'd better get in to see your father. Okay, Miss Brooks. See you in the cafeteria when you're finished with Daddy, or vice versa. Come in. Well, it's Miss Brooks. Sit down, won't you? Over here by my desk. That's where all my friends sit when they drop in to see me. You all right, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> well, now that you mention it, Miss Brooks, I'm not all right at all. I'm very embarrassed. You see, this morning, Mr. Boynton presented me with a four-pound frog. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to call it? It's this brass ornament you see before you, and that's the crux of my embarrassment. You see, I had refused to join in my daughter's plan to purchase a gift for Boynton, but... When he gave me this uh, brass object, I told him I had a gift for him at my home. Well, it's not too late to pick it up, Mr. Conklin. But I have nothing for him at my home. Well, how do you think I can help you, Mr. Conklin? Uh, I find this most difficult to put into words, but 
Although I don't believe in borrowing, I simply must purchase a gift for Boynton. And, Miss Brooks, as I've heard the student body put it, I'm stony. Mr. Conklin. Yes? You're still stony. <laughs> oh, then there's no sense in wasting each other's time. Is the good day, Miss Brooks. Good day, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Miss Brooks, what's new in Inner Sanctum? Not very much, Walter. What have you got in those two paper bags? Well, in this one, I got the tie that Mr. Boynton thinks Miss Enright gave him. Owls on parade? Yeah. Mr. Boynton said he'd have no use for it, so he gave it to me. Of course, he warned me never to wear it when Miss Enright's around. If you're smart, you won't wear it when you're around. <laughs> but gosh, Miss Brooks, now I'm stuck without a gift for Mr. Boynton. Can you think of anything I could give him? Sure, but I don't think I'd fit in that bag. <laughs> and while we're on the subject, have you seen Miss Enright around anywhere? Oh, no, Miss Brooks. I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that she doesn't get to talk to Mr. Boynton. Me too. I'd better get him out of the cafeteria and over to Marty's malt shop for lunch. Are you going to eat now, Walter? Not just yet. i got to deliver this sandwich to Mr. Conklin. That's what's in this other bag. Oh. He's eating in his office today. He says there's something in the cafeteria that makes him very nervous. I know. You pass the cashier on the way out. <laughs> huh? Forget it. I'd better hurry now, Walter. See you later. Okay, Miss Brooks. Come in. Oh, it's you, Denton. Yes, sir. Here's your lunch. It came to 55 cents. Did it really? Yes, sir. I laid it out for you. That was very considerate, Denton, but I'm afraid you'll have to wait to be reimbursed. I, uh, I don't want to break a big... How big? Get out, boy. <laughs> no, 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 wait, wait. What have you got in that other bag? It's just a necktie, Mr. Conklin. A necktie? Yeah, would you like to see it? I'll open the bag for well, you. Just I... hand it over. I'll open it myself. Thank you. Ah! <laughs> Mr. Conklin? Uh, yes, it's delightful. But frankly, Denton, I don't think it quite suits your personality. However, I might be persuaded to take it off your hands. Yes, indeed, I think I can put this tie to very good use. Well, sure, Mr. Conklin, I'll sell it to you real cheap. Oh, uh, I'm not interested in buying it, Denton, but perhaps we could work out a trade. A trade? Here on my desk is a beautiful brass frog. It's brand new, you see. I just took it out of this lovely maroon gift box. If you'll give me the tie, you may have this charming ornament. It's a deal, Mr. Conklin. Yes, indeed. I think I can put this frog to very good use. I'm glad I caught you before you went home, Mr. Boynton. This is the first chance I've had to give you this little homecoming present. For another present? My goodness. I certainly appreciate this, Harriet. Not only because of the spirit behind it, but because it serves as a reminder that I ought to pick up a little gift for Miss Brooks. You see, I'm having dinner with her tonight. Oh, I think that's stupendous, Mr. Boynton. What are you going to get her? Nothing very ornate, I'm afraid. I spent quite a bit of money on my trip, you know. By the way, what's in this package you've given me? It's a hanky with your initial on it. A big B. B for Brooks. I mean, Boynton. I had it gift wrapped for you, Mr. Boynton, but if you'd like to open it... Oh, now... no, no, leave it wrapped, and, and thanks again, Harriet. Yes, indeed, I think I can put this hanky to very good use. Do you think Mr. Boynton enjoyed the dinner, Connie? Oh, I'm sure he did, Mrs. Davis. Maybe you ought to go back into the living room, Mr. Boynton. I'll finish these dishes myself. I wouldn't dream of it, Mrs. Davis. I'll get my chance to be alone with Mr. Boynton later when you go to the movies. Oh. Am I going to the movies? <laughs> I saved up for it all day. <laughs> Very well, dear. But before I go, I'll make some coffee for the others. Others? I forgot to tell you, Connie. <laughs> Me and that absent mind of mine. <laughs> Mr. Conklin called late this afternoon and said he missed Mr. Boynton at school... So he'd drop over tonight with a little gift he had for him. Oh. That was right after Walter Denton called, and he said he'd be over with his little present. This is the earliest Christmas we've ever had. <laughs> now go on inside, Connie. Forget the dishes. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. See you in a few minutes. 
Well, Miss Brooks, you all finished with the dishes? Mrs. Davis gave me time off for good behavior. <laughs> I, I don't want you to think I neglected to bring you a little memento of my recent trip. It's just that I, I was waiting for the propitious moment to present it to you, and, well, I think this is it. Here, Miss Brooks, I hope you like it. Why, Mr. Boynton, what a beautifully wrapped package. Oh, it's a shame to open it, but I'm so curious to find out what it is. So am I. Uh, that is, I... <laughs> I'm curious to see how you like it. I don't like it. I love it. <laughs> uh, may I... May I see it, please? Surely. Here. Oh, thanks. I'll just... Ah! <laughs> you don't like it. Oh, I love it. You, you have no idea how difficult it was for me to get a handkerchief like this with a design to match the tie Miss Enright gave me this morning. Yeah, I don't know. I know I didn't seem too crazy about it at first, but it, it kind of grew on me. Look, it's initialed B for Brooks. Or bought by Harriet. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, if that tie grew on you so swiftly today, why did you palm it off on Walter Denton? Walter who? <laughs> Well, uh, hadn't you better answer the front door, Miss Brooks? It's not locked. Come in. Oh, good evening, Miss Brooks, Mr. Boynton. Good evening, Mr. Conklin. I'm certainly glad to see you. He sure is. My, uh, my daughter Harriet told me you were having dinner here, Boynton, so I thought I'd drop over and present you with this little welcome home gift I promised this afternoon. <laughs> here. Oh, thank you, Mr. Conklin. Uh, shall I unwrap it now? If you wish. One thing about Osgood Conklin, he never stints on gifts. I bought this original creation in the most exclusive haberdashery in town. <laughs> you don't like it. We love it. Always have. What could be lovelier than a yellow tree with a purple owl playing a bugle? <laughs> Unless it was a purple tree with an orange pig playing a fife. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Mr. Conklin. It's just what I needed. Oh, don't mention it, my boy. I still owe you a debt of gratitude for that lovely brass frog you gave me. I shall treasure it always. Come in. Oh. Evening, folks. Harriet Conklin told me you'd be here, so... Mr. Conklin... <laughs> What are you doing here? He just came over to give Mr. Boynton this gorgeous tie. See, Walter, with the tree and the owl? Gee, that's very... Pre oh, no. What are you all knowing about, Denver? Uh, Walter, did you say you had a gift for me? Oh, yes, Mr. Boynton. I got it right here in this maroon box. Oh, no. <laughs> What are you all knowing about, Mr. Conklin? Uh, Denton, I'd better have a word with you in the kitchen, boy. Oh, sure, Mr. Conklin. Just as soon as I give Mr. Boynton this brass frog. Brass frog? Brass frog. Brass frog. <laughs> well, thank you, Walter. It uh, certainly is fun exchanging gifts, isn't it? <laughs> yes, and tonight we're really exchanging them. <laughs> Well, it's the idea that counts anyway, isn't it? And I've gotten some swell things, things that make me almost glad I left Madison so I could come back. Look, Mr. Conklin, how do you like this suede jacket I've got on? Oh, it's extremely attractive, Boynton. Miss Brooks gave me this. Come in. Well, good evening, everyone. Hello, Miss Enright. Miss Enright? Miss Enright. Miss Enright. <laughs> me I'd find you here, Mr. Boynton. Uh, she, she did? You remember Harriet, known to her intimates as the town crier? <laughs> oh, let me look at you, Mr. Boynton. My, that suede jacket looks simply divine. Ain't it a dandy? <laughs> uh, Miss Enright, why don't you and I go for a walk? It's pretty stuffy in here. Oh, but I just got here, darling. Let me admire my jacket for just a moment. Your jacket? Mr. Boynton, I better have a ticket with you, talk with you in the kitchen. <laughs> Say, what's going on here? This morning I left a gift for you, Mr. Boynton, on your desk. My card was attached. Oh, yes, I, I got the tie, Miss Enright. But... Tie? I didn't give you a tie. I gave you that suede jacket you're wearing. You? <laughs> the card said... <laughs> Miss Brooks, how did you... Miss Brooks, where are you? I'm 
I'm over here in the closet with the rest of your gifts. <laughs> what are you doing in there? I'm using the hanky for a blindfold, the tie for a noose, and Gridley, you may fire the brass frog when ready. <laughs> As our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Luster cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas' magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster Cream Shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, Luster Cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a Luster Cream Shampoo. So gentle, Luster Cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl, you owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I finally realized that there was nothing I could do but be completely honest and admit, in spite of what the consequences might be, that the entire affair was the fault of Walter Denton. Although the embarrassment was pretty evenly distributed, Mr. Boynton felt that the least he could do was see Miss Enright home. And Walter, of course, dropped Mr. Conklin, like a hot potato. <laughs> when they had all gone, Mrs. Davis came in with six cups of coffee. Where did everybody go, Connie? Out, Mrs. Davis. Thanks just the same for the coffee, but I'm going to bed oh, now. Uh, just a minute, Connie. I have a little favor to ask of you. You know, everyone gave Mr. Boynton a welcome home gift today except me. Unfortunately, I'm a little short of funds, so I can't buy him anything. But if you don't mind, I'd like to iron that muffler you gave me last Christmas and give it to him in the morning. Please, Mrs. Davis, I've just You had know it. the one I mean, Connie. The one with the yellow tree on the cliff by the ocean <laughs> with a purple owl. You're a little late, so good night, Mrs. Davis. Next week, turn into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Mustard Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Palm Olive shaving cream comes both ways. And whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new palm olive way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get palm olive brushless or palm olive lather shaving cream today. October 24th is the anniversary of the United Nations Charter and will be observed by almost the entire civilized world. International cooperation is dependent upon you, individual citizens everywhere. The U.N. must have your support, faith, and enthusiasm. For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North, the exciting, fun-packed adventures of an amateur detective and his beautiful wife. Tune in Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS, the comedy broadcasting system. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. episode of Our Miss Brooks, written by Al Lewis. Well, many of us find it extremely difficult to get up early every morning, but Our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, has been doing it for years. Yes, and I've learned one thing about early rising that's helped me immeasurably. Once I jump out of bed, close the window, and do my setting up exercises, there's only one more thing I want to do, and that's to get right back in bed again. <laughs> Last Friday morning, though, I was up and almost dressed by the time my landlady knocked on the door. 
trying to get up, Connie. I am up, Mrs. Davis. Come on in. I'm trying to get to school early so I can chat with Mr. Boynton for a few minutes before our first class. Is Mr. Boynton still as unapproachable as ever, Connie? I guess so, Mrs. Davis. But you know something? During this past week, I've gotten closer to him than ever before. Really, dear? How did you do that? I've been wearing my sneakers to school. (laughs) I hope I've got time for breakfast before Walter Denton comes to pick me up. There's something he wants to talk to me about before school starts. Well, he can talk to you at breakfast, Connie. My goodness, you've got to keep your strength up some way. We both know you don't get enough sleep. Well, I didn't last night. Minerva slept in here with me, and she was very restless. I don't know what's the matter with that cat lately. Between you and me, Connie, I think she's got something. Between you and me, I think she's got several. (laughs) Maybe it's a mistake to let her get so friendly with the collie next door. They play together all the time, you know. Oh, so that's the source. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Minerva had me up half the night with her pounding. That's just her tail beating on the floor while she's hunting. Oh, I don't mind her tail thumping so much, but every time she catches something with one paw, she applauds with the other three. Suppose we join Minerva in the breakfast nook. I've just given her some milk. Fine, I'll have a saucer full, too. Sit right down, dear. I'll boil you a couple of eggs. Just one egg will be plenty, Mrs. Davis. Well, I... Oh, (coughs) Walter... That must be Walter Denton now. Just six eggs will be plenty, Mrs. Davis. (laughs) The door isn't locked. Come in. Walter. Ah, hiya, Miss Brooks, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Walter. How do you want your eggs, Walter? Quickly, please. <laughs> any breakfast yet? Oh, sure, but it's 7.30 almost, and we eat an awful early breakfast at my place. How early? Quarter to seven. <laughs> I don't know how you're still standing up. <laughs> I'll whip up an omelet for all of us. Miss Brooks, I'd like to ask you about something. What's that, Walter? Well, as you know, Halloween is usually celebrated tomorrow night, Saturday. But Perry Conklin's going up to her folks' bungalow at Crystal Lake for the weekend. So we wondered if it would be all right with you if we celebrated the holiday tonight. Well, why come to me? Shouldn't you contact the Goblins Union? <laughs> we wanted to sort of have a little party. You know, Harriet, my pal Stretch Snodgrass, and I, and... Uh, we were planning on inviting you, too. Oh? Uh, where were you planning on holding this party, Walter? At your place. <laughs> How nice of you to invite me along. <laughs> but I'm afraid we couldn't have any Halloween parties here, Walter. After all, I don't own this cottage. I just rent a room for Mrs. Davis. Oh, we've already got her permission. She's going to the movies tonight. Harriet asked her on the phone yesterday. It's just up to you, Miss Brooks. Well, I'm afraid I'm not interested in Halloween parties, Walter. I've got quite a bit of work to catch up on, and tonight looks like an ideal time to do it. Sorry, but you'll have to hold your party someplace else. Gee, Miss Brooks, Harriet and Stretch will be awfully disappointed. And so will Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton? Yeah. I was talking to him yesterday, and he was saying what swell fun he always thought Halloween was when he was a kid. And then we invited him to the party, too, and he accepted. And now there's no place to have the party. What's wrong with having the party right here? Hello, principal's office. Osgood Conklin himself speaking. Hello, Osgood. It's me, Martha. We've been married 18 years, woman. I know your name. That's easily remedied. Goodbye. Wait, not good. I just called to remind you about your doctor's appointment this morning. He said he wanted to see you before we go to Crystal Lake tomorrow. I am well aware of that fact. I've had plenty of time to think about it during the sleepless hours I spent listening to your dog thumping his tail at the foot of our bed all night. But Prince was so lonesome, dear. After all, we've got each other. He's all alone. Well, he wasn't alone last night. I never heard such scratching in all my born days. What's he got, anyway? Well, he can't possibly have anything, dear. You know he doesn't play with other dogs. In fact, he would have died of loneliness last week if I hadn't taken him over to Mrs. Davis's to play with her cat, Minerva. 
Well, you've got to keep him away from me. My blood pressure is higher than it's been in years. To make my morning complete, when I bent down to tie my shoelaces, my glasses fell off. Did they break? Not until I straightened up and stepped on them. Well, darling, in a couple of days in Crystal Lake, that will make a new man of you. Now go down to the doctor's and get a nice sedative to take with you. Very well, Martha. It's a good thing I have an extra pair of glasses with me or I couldn't find my way to the door. Now, whatever you do, Osgood, don't break gold. Thank you, my dear. I think that's sterling advice. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, it's later than I thought. I'd better hurry. So you see, Walter, if we all meet in the cafeteria at lunchtime, we can make the plan for... Oh, good. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I presume. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Conklin. I didn't see you coming. Oh, dear, I seem to have broken your glasses. Do you have another pair? No, Miss Brooks, I haven't. <laughs> but uh, perhaps I could get you a long stick and let you smash the windows in my office. <laughs> you seem to be in quite a hurry, Mr. Conklin. Could I maybe take you somewhere? Who is speaking? <laughs> it's me, Walter Denton. Your daughter Harriet's dream boat. <laughs> My daughter, Harriet, yeah. I'll talk to you later, Miss Brooks. Denton, pick up that shattered glass. Yes, sir. Well, what should I do with it, Mr. Conklin? Eat it, you lame brain gun! <laughs> Mr. Conklin's sure in a bad mood today. He looks pretty purple, doesn't he? Even for him. He certainly is excitable. Hi, Walter. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hi. Hello, Harriet. Did you run to Daddy yet this morning? It's in the hands of the insurance company now. <laughs> His temper's pretty miserable today. Yes, I know. Poor Daddy. He's been depressed all week long. I don't know what it is. We all try to please him. What he needs is some recreation and diversion. Say, I have an idea. What is it, Miss Brooks? Well, instead of my place tonight, why don't we have our Halloween party at your house, Harriet? That way we could surprise your father and cheer him up a little bit. <laughs> Wonderful. Miss Brooks, you've done it again. Anxious as I was to get back into Mr. Conklin's good graces, I determined to make the Halloween party Friday night a roaring success. I had asked the kids to meet me in the school cafeteria at lunchtime, and the first one to show up was Madison's star athlete, Stretch Snodgrass. Although a whiz on the football field, Stretch's outstanding scholastic achievement occurred during a test last week when he spelled his name correctly. <laughs> I was having a cup of coffee when he approached my table. So here I am, Miss Brooks. Mind if I sit down? Not at all, Stretch, but wouldn't you like to bring some food over before we discuss the party? Oh, no, ma'am. I already ate. Please, Stretch. <laughs> I've already eaten. Oh, good. Then we can get right down to business. <laughs> Walter said he thought we all had a masquerade or something tonight. That's a fine idea, Stretch. You could come as a student. <laughs> well, I got my outfit all set, Miss Brooks. I got some chaps home and spurs and, and two six-shooters that shoot real blanks. I'm coming as Hopalong Cassidy. That is, if nobody minds. Why should anybody mind, unless Roy Rogers shows up? <laughs> what are you going to masquerade as, Miss Brooks? Oh, I haven't made up my mind yet, Stretch. Of course, every good Halloween party should have a witch. Yes, I might come as a witch. Perfect. <laughs> Don't sound so enthusiastic. It's pretty short notice to get a costume made, and I may not... Why go to all that trouble? Why don't you just wear what you got on? Big as he is, I'll have to slug him. Now, look, Stretch. I... Hi, Miss Brooks, Stretch. Well, things are sure shaping up. Look at these swell noisemakers I bought this morning. When did you find time to get all this junk, Walter? I sneaked out of one of my morning classes. Walter, you didn't. Well, it was important, Miss Brooks. Besides, there's no harm done. Nobody even noticed I was gone. That's what I like, a nice, observant teacher. Oh, it wasn't the teacher's fault. You were facing the blackboard at the time. <laughs> Look at this horn. It's got a siren in the mouthpiece. Listen. <laughs> Me! 
Please, Walter, you're in the cafeteria. So what? One more blast like that, the beef stew will pull over to the right. <laughs> now, tell me, how are you going to the masquerade? I got a terrific idea, Miss Brooks. I'm just going to put on an old sheet. Do you think Mr. Conklin will get a kick out of me as a ghost? If he thought it was on the level, it would add ten years to his life. <laughs> I haven't quite decided yet. Any suggestions? Well, just one. I don't want you to think I'm being fresh or anything, but, well, this is going to be a Halloween party, and, well, I'd be glad to furnish you with a broom. <laughs> I guess I'm a natural for it. <laughs> Look who's coming over. Oh, it's Mr. Boynton. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Walter. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Hello, Stretch. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Goodbye, Walter. Goodbye, Stretch. <laughs> Don't you know the old expression, two's company, three's a crowd? Oh, sure I do. But there's four of us. Come on, Stretch. we got to help Harriet figure out a costume for tonight. Uh, see you later, folks. Yeah, see you later, folks. Oh, so long, boys. Well, Miss Brooks, I think it's a splendid idea you're giving this little surprise party for our principal tonight. It should do him a world of good. It should do us a world of good, too, if he brightens up a bit. What kind of an outfit do you think you'll wear, Mr. Boynton? Well, I... I've got a skeleton costume home that I used to have quite a bit of fun with in my college days. It's just a black, tight-fitting garment with a bunch of bones hanging on it. Bones? <laughs> yes, they're treated with a phosphorescent paint that makes them glow in the dark. It's quite a startling effect, the more so since I gathered the bones when I was an anatomy student. From anyone I know? <laughs> I don't mean to dwell on it, Miss Brooks, but I find bones a rather fascinating subject, don't you? That depends on what they're wrapped up in. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, how, how are you masquerading tonight? Oh, I don't know. If you're coming as a skeleton, maybe I'll come as a bottle of vitamin. <laughs> I'm really a little stumped, Mr. Boynton. What do you think I should be? Well, the two most popular figures associated with Halloween are a black cat and a witch. And I'm much too tall for a cat. <laughs> Walter! Oh, Walter! Yes, Brooks? Get a lube job on that broom, boy. Constance Brooks rides tonight. <laughs> I'm glad we're going away in the morning, Martha. Dr. Benson told me I'm very close to the breaking point. Yes. Of course, Arthur. Uh, Judith, don't shout so. <laughs> he said that some of my trouble was caused by my blood pressure, but that part of it was due to an overactive imagination. He wants me to be calm, relax more. <laughs> I'd like to see him relax with that recurring dream I've had. You mean the one where the ghost visits you at night? Yes. Only the last couple of times it's gotten worse. Instead of a plain ghost, I've been getting one with Walter Denton's head on it. Really, Osgood, I, I just don't know what you've got against that poor boy. Harriet's very fond of him. Then she should see a doctor, too. Where is she, Martha? Well, she's in her room, dear, getting dressed. She said something about a party tonight. Parties? It's all kids nowadays think about well, there won't be any parties at Crystal Lake. There won't be any nightmares either. Why, Martha, do you realize that while I was sitting in the doctor's office today, I saw a bulldog by his desk? A bulldog? It was the shadow of his umbrella stand. But I almost jumped out of my skin before he explained it. Well, things like that happen to people every day, Osgood. Not to me, they don't. At least they'd better not. How do you think the Board of Education would like it if they thought one of their principals went around seeing bulldogs? <laughs> Just don't mention it to anyone, darling. Now I'm going to get you a glass of warm milk and you stay right comfy in your chair till I get back. You're very well. <laughs> yes. That thing looked like a bulldog. <laughs> Martha's right, though. I'd better not mention it to a soul. Now, who in the world can that be? Coming! Good evening, Mr. Conklin. May I come in? There's no tactical way I can refuse you admission. <laughs> come in, Miss Brooks. Have the others arrived yet? Others? 
What others? You'll see when they get here. Is Harriet at home? Yes, yes, she's putting on her party dress. Oh, then you know about it. It should do you a lot of good, Mr. Conklin. There's nothing like a house full of people to get your mind off yourself. A house full of... Uh, Miss Brooks, is this party to be given in this house? Of course. I see. Then if you'll excuse me, I'll just take my hat and coat and beat an orderly retreat. But, Mr. Conklin... My doctor has forbidden any excitement whatsoever. Your doctor? This is a fine time to tell me. I mean, I didn't know you were in such bad shape, Mr. Conklin. I am on the verge of a nervous collapse, Miss Brooks. But I don't want to spoil everybody's fun. I'll just leave quietly. Leave? But, Mr. Conklin, where will you go? What's the difference where I go? <laughs> I'll just wander around the park like a homeless gypsy. You can't do that. You wouldn't look good in earrings. I mean, you're not a well man, Mr. Conklin. Look, Mrs. Davis is going to the movies tonight. Now, why don't you let me drive you over to our place until I can eliminate the horde of pets? Uh, guests who are coming here. <laughs> You'll love it over there, Mr. Conklin. You'll be able to relax completely. If it will stave off my breakdown, Miss Brooks, it's the least I can do for my family. <laughs> Miss Brooks left right after dinner, Mr. Boynton. I guess she forgot to buy a few items for the party tonight. I'm sure she'll be right back. Fine. Swell. This way our surprise will work out even better. Surprise? Yes, ma'am. We thought we'd try out some of our Halloween tricks on Miss Brooks before we go over to Mr. Conklin's house. That's a wonderful idea. I hope I didn't scare you in my ghost outfit. No, I thought you were the laundry man. <laughs> How do you like my costume, Mrs. Davis? Nice. You've lost weight, haven't you? This, this is a skeleton suit in honor of Halloween. <laughs> Isn't that terrifying? And who's this cowboy with you? Well, I'm Hopalong Cassidy, Mrs. Davis, but I'm really Stretch Snodgrass. <laughs> I'd never have known. Well, if you'll all go into the house, I'm sure Miss Brooks will be delighted to see you. I've got to get down to the theater now. Oh, well, what movie are you seeing tonight, Mrs. Davis? Jolson sings again, again. Again, again? I saw it last week also. <laughs> Have a nice time, children. What should I do with this bucket of water we're ducking for apples in, Waller? Oh, just put it down by the piano, Stretch. Now, I'll tell you what we'll do. Before Miss Brooks comes back, let's all hide somewhere so we can really surprise her. Good idea, Walter. Now, why don't you get behind that couch... Stretch, you hide behind the kitchen door, and I'll get into the hall closet. Great. And we'll all come out when I blow this whistle. <whistles> okay? Got you, Walter. Hey, look, out the window. Miss Brooks is coming up the walk, and she's got Mr. Conklin with her. Mr. Conklin? Oh, she probably wanted to get him out of the way while we were getting things ready at his place. So much the better. We'll surprise both of them at the same time. Now, first I'll put the lights out. Quick, let's get out of sight. Well, here we are, Mr. Conklin. I guess Mrs. Davis has left for the movies. The lights are all out. But it does seem quite deserted in here. I'll turn on this hall light so you can see to hang your things up in the closet. I'll turn some lights on in the living room while you put your hat and coat away. Thank you, Miss Brooks. Miss <laughs> Brooks! Miss Brooks! What is it, Mr. Conklin? What's the trouble? Your closet! In the hall! What do you keep in there? Mr. Conklin? I see. I see. Tell me, Miss Brooks, is it a long black coat with luminous bones? Luminous bones? Uh, oh, no. Uh, oh, please wait right here, Mr. Conklin. I'll investigate. Oh, it's me, Miss Brooks. You should have seen Mr. Conklin's face when Get he was... behind those other coats immediately, Mr. Boynton. But, Miss Brooks... I can't explain now, but don't you dare come out of there until you get a signal. Well, Miss Brooks, what did you see? See? Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything, Mr. Conklin. It must have been your imagination. My, 
Imagination? <laughs> then the doctor was right. Is that, Mr. Conklin? I'd, I'd rather not talk about it, Miss Brooks. If I could just lie down somewhere. Oh, of course, Mr. Conklin. Just stretch out on this couch. I'll go get another cushion for you. All right. Ah, uh, uh, that's better. <laughs> I must be quite a sick man. <laughs> if I weren't sick, I wouldn't be moaning like this. Say, I'm not the one who's moaning. I've returned. I've come back. Who's that? Where are you? Look behind you. Behind the cow. Behind the cow. Are you all right? What happened? Miss, Miss Brooks, how long have I been asleep? Asleep? Yes. You just hit the couch, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Which reminds me, maybe you'd better see a good psychiatrist. This screaming of yours can lead to something dangerous. Just, just do me a favor, Miss Brooks. Look behind that couch. Certainly, sir, if it'll make you feel any better. But I assure you, there's absolutely nothing behind this couch. <laughs> I'm sorry if I startled you, Mr. Conklin, but my cat Minerva's back here. With a sheet? She was making her bed. Stay out of sight, Minerva. There's a good gerga boy. A girl. If you don't mind, Miss Brooks, I'd like to take a couple of pills my doctor prescribed. May I have some water, please? Certainly, sir. If you've got an extra pill or two, I'll be happy to join you. <laughs> just sit right here, Miss Conklin. I'll go into the kitchen and get some water. Now, on second thought, you'd better come with me. I don't want you to get nervous again. Yes, I, I think you're right, Miss Brooks. doesn't do for me to be alone lately. Now, where is that light switch? Well, dog might catch if it ain't roundup time. taken leave of my senses? Oh, it isn't a real leave, Mr. Conklin. You're just on a weekend pass. Oh, lots of people get temporary hallucinations. Maybe we'd better go back to your house. Yes, yes, at a time like this, I suppose I should be near my loved one. Happy Halloween, Mr. Conklin. Look, it's me. Sandra, when did you... How did you... What's this? It's just my coat coming over. Get back to the closet. Uh, it's me, Mr. Conklin. I'm a skeleton, see? Look at me, Mr. Conklin. I'm hop along Cassidy, and I'll plug the first ombre that makes the moon. Snodgrass. I'll... Oh, stop that! <laughs> oh, I must, uh, I must control myself. What's wrong, Mr. Conklin? You, you don't seem to be enjoying yourself. Yeah, you act all jumpy and funny. Gosh, Miss Brooks went to a lot of trouble to get this thing organized. Walter, please. Oh, Miss Brooks organized it, did she? Sure, she planned the whole thing. She deserves every bit of credit. Well, she's certainly going to get it. Miss Brooks, I want to... Miss Brooks, Miss Brooks, get your head out of that bucket. This is no time to be ducking for apples. <laughs> Who's ducking for apples? I'm trying to drown myself. <laughs> And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin was so glad to find out that the things he thought had been happening to him had been happening to him, 
that he excused us all and hurried home. Shortly afterwards, I excused Walter and Stretch, which left just Mr. Boynton, the parlor sofa, and me. Well, here we are, Miss Brooks. You know, with that lamplight shining on your hair, you're, you're absolutely, well... Yes, Mr. Boynton? Yoo-hoo! Yoo-hoo, folks! What's that? Look at the window. It's Mrs. Davis with a pumpkin head. Just what I needed. Happy Halloween, Connie. Trick or treat. I've got a trick, Mrs. Davis. Here's 60 cents. Treat yourself to Josen things again, again, again. Be sure to listen to Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob LeBond speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and Bluster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks written by Al Lewis. Well, the football season is just about reaching its peak in most of the nation's high schools. But somehow the fever seems to have bypassed our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School. Yes, I'm afraid I've always been one of football's more passive fanatics. But as faculty advisor to the cheerleading squad, an honor foisted upon me some months ago, I was invited to a special meeting held in our principal's office during lunch period last Thursday. In addition to Mr. Conklin, those present included his daughter Harriet, Mr. Philip Boynton, our bashful biology teacher... Walter Denton, the manager of the team, and Stretch Snodgrass, star quarterback and captain. Stretch has always been something of a paradox to me. I've never been able to understand how a brain which can retain so many clever football plays can have such difficulty in spelling a word like cat. (laughs) Be that as it may, Mr. Conklin wasted no time in telling us why we had been summoned. As you all know, tomorrow is the day we play Clay City High. You also know that I consider Jason Brill the principal of that institution my arch rival. What you do not know is that Brill has obtained a small bear cub in honor of the Clay City Cubs, which he intends to trot out between halves. We, too, must be prepared to entertain the spectators with our mascot. It's as simple as that. Not quite, Mr. Conklin. Our football team has always been known as the Madison Comets. It might be rather difficult to lead a comet out between halves. (laughs) Uh, let's try, uh... <laughs> Let's try to be constructive, shall we? <laughs> I intend to change the name of the football team to fit the mascot we select. I'm open to your suggestions. Before we make any suggestions, Daddy, where did Mr. Brill get the bear cub you mentioned? Uh, from the circus, Harriet. You know the one in Moore's Meadow, which bogged down on its way to winter quarters? Then maybe we could get something from them. Maybe even a tiger. Boy, the Madison Tigers. I can just picture it. At halftime, we lead this ferocious tiger to the Clay City bench where Mr. Brill is sitting. Can't you just see the expression on Mr. Brill's face? I'm not going to look down a tiger's throat just for that. (laughs) No, I'm afraid a tiger isn't quite original enough, Denton. Oh, let's see. How about the Madison Monsters? Yes, we ought to be able to pick up a cheap monster somewhere. (laughs) With you as the team's manager, Denton, that name is almost ideal. (laughs) With that, you've given me an idea. It should be an alliterative name. Now, how about you, Snodgrass? Any ideas on the subject? Yes, sir. What does alit... What does alit... uh... What does alliterative mean? Don't you know either? (laughs) Alliterative means when words start with the same initial, like the Clay City Cubs or the Pittsburgh Pirates. How about the Madison Mustangs, Mr. Conklin? We ought to be able to rent one of those for the game. And maybe Mr. Boynton could ride him around the stadium at halftime. <laughs> no, not me. No, no, if you wanted to borrow my pet frog, McDougal, as mascot. <laughs> not a bad idea. Of course, we'd have to get a rather tiny saddle. <laughs> 
Oh, now, wait a minute. Stretch, your father runs a pet shop, doesn't he? Yes, he does, Mr. Boynton. But we ain't got no animals over there that would be good for what we want them for right now, I don't think. <laughs> Where in the world did you acquire that manner of speech, Snodgrass? I'm in Miss Brooks's English class. Stop boasting, Stretch, or we may both be back in grammar school soon. <laughs> what sort of animals do you have in the shop at the present time? Mostly puppies and birds. Say, I got an idea. My dad got four brand new blue jays this morning. Please, Stretch, Mr. Conklin isn't interested in what your father puts on his corns. <laughs> well, I don't mean blue jay corn plasters, Miss Brooks. I mean real ones. They're awful pretty and they could... No... If they ever flew away, my dad had lambasted a living. He'd be peeved. <laughs> I know. Maybe I could bring over my turtle as a mascot. The Madison Mud Turtles. Now, that's sort of alliterative. Uh, how big a turtle have you got, Stretch? He's exactly three inches square. Now, there's a brilliant <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> how could the crowd in a football stadium possibly see a three inch turtle? We could paint Madison in huge red letters on his back. This meeting is getting absolutely nowhere. As usual, the important decisions have to stem from my own creative brain. I will come to a decision by the time school ends and delegate one of you to pick up the animal of my choice. You may all go to lunch now. This, this. Aye, aye, sir. Where are you going to have lunch today, Miss Brooks? Marty's Mall Shop? No, Mr. Boynton. I'm going to live dangerously and go to the school cafeteria. It should be much more inspirational. Inspirational? Yes. I had some stew there the other day, which I'm sure would have made a wonderful mascot. <laughs> well, school's over, Daddy. Did you think of anything yet? Yes, Harriet, I have taking into consideration the fact that the Board of Education makes no financial provision for teen mascots, I've decided we must get something which won't cost too much money to feed. What did you hit on? A gopher. A gopher? But, Daddy... If it's good enough for Minnesota, it's good enough for us. <laughs> we'll just capture one this evening in our backyard. Uh, excuse me, Harriet. Principal's office. Osgood Conklin on this end. Hello, Osgood. This is Martha, dear. Your wife. I know your title. I conferred it on you. <laughs> now, what is it, my dear? Well, I'm afraid I have some rather distressing news. Your brother is staying over another day? <laughs> no, no, dear. I, I broke one of your favorite bookends. I was cleaning it, and it just slipped out of my hands. I don't know how it uh, There have been greater disasters known to man, Martha. We'll simply replace the bookend. But it was a gift, dear. I don't know where they were purchased, and... Wait a minute. Miss Brooks was admiring them just the other day at tea. She said she saw an identical pair in a curio shop right near her house. Do you think it would be asking too much to have her pick one up for us? It would be a labor of love for the woman. My teachers adore me, you know. <laughs> I, I know. Which bookend was it, Martha? What design? It was the one with the elephant on it, Osgood. She'll remember it all right. Then the matter is closed. Think no more of it, my dear. I'll see you in just a little while. Oh, uh, by the way, Martha, I'm rather tired, so when I do come home, I'll take a little nap in the living room. Please see that the squealing urchins with which our neighborhood abounds are shooed as far away from our porch as possible. I'll try, Osgood. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Now then, Harriet, fetch Miss Brooks at once, if you please. I can't, Daddy. She's gone home. The speed with which they depart is always a revelation to me. <laughs> now, take this note, child. Attention, Miss Brooks. I want you to purchase at once an elephant bookend of the type you admired so much at our house recently. Now, take that right over Oh, gosh, Daddy, if you're going to send me on any errands, I just can't go. I've got volleyball practice with a team this minute. But I promised your mother I've got well, to let get me this... look out in the hall. Maybe somebody's still around. Stretch! Oh, Stretch! Hi, Harriet. What can I do for you? You can deliver a note, boy. Do you know where Miss Brooks lives? Well, yes, sir, with Mrs. Davis. Right. Now, take this note right over to her, will you? Sure, Mr. Conklin. Where does Mrs. Davis live? <laughs> 
The address is 295 Carroll Avenue. Now, be sure she gets that message immediately. Don't worry about me, Mr. Conklin. When it comes to messages, I'm like the Pony Express. I always get my man. (laughs) See you later, Harriet. Pony boy, pony boy, won't you be my pony boy? Oh, Stretch, would you come here a moment? Oh, hi, Mr. Boynton. What can I do for you? Well, you can let me have a piece of paper, if you will. I'd like to copy down the football schedule that's on the bulletin board here. Well, sure, Mr. Boynton. Here's a piece of this paper I don't need. Nothing wrote on it anyhow. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm glad to be of service. See you at the game tomorrow. Okay, Stretch. Now, I'll just... Well, that's funny. There's nothing written on the front, but what's this on the back? It says, bookend of the type you admired so much at our house recently. Oh, well, it can't be very important if Stretch had it. I don't like to bother you at home like this, Miss Brooks, but Mr. Conklin said it was important that you get this message right away. Let's see it, Stretch. Oh, I took the liberty of reading it on the way over. Looks like you've been degolated to get our mascot. <laughs> I've been degolated, all right. <laughs> Attention, Miss Brooks. I want you to purchase at once an elephant. Boy. (laughs) What a mascot. Mr. Conklin sure went whole hog. You went whole elephant. (laughs) This must be some kind of joke. I'd better call him up and find out what it's all about. Are you sure you got this note directly from Mr. Conklin? Sure. He handed it to me in his office as I was walking. Hello? Quiet stretch. Hello? Be brief, please. Wasted words are wasted time. Osgood Conklin speaking. Uh, Mr. Conklin, this is Miss Brooks. Naturally. I was trying to take a nap. Uh, This, I might add, is the third time in one week you have jangled me out of my afternoon doze. Now, what is it you want? I just got your note, Mr. Conklin, about this elephant. As I recall, Miss Brooks, the note was quite simply written. I don't expect you to be the greatest English teacher in the world, but I do expect you to be able to read a few simple sentences in the language. But, Mr. Conklin, I... Now, please do as I've asked and let me get some sleep. But, Mr. Conklin, what kind do you want? I've seen them before, Miss Brooks. Just get one. (laughs) But, Mr. Conklin, the money, how will I pay... Charge it to me. (laughs) Now, for heaven's sake, ring off and don't call me back till you've got it. Yes, sir. Stretch, we're going to need some transportation. Is your jalopy out front? Sure, Miss Brooks. Where are we going? We're going down to the Bombay branch of Gimbel's and charge an elephant. (laughs) Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. Eminent dental authorities supervised hundreds of college men and women for over two years. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate's right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate Dental Cream is directed, using Colgate's exclusively showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research indicates decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst after meals or snacks. Brushing teeth with Colgate's, as directed, helps remove acids before they harm enamel. Yes, Colgate's contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient, for effective daily dental care. So remember, always use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Well, Thursday afternoon, Stretch's jalopy wouldn't start until it was too late to go to the circus grounds. So I made arrangements with Mr. Boynton to pick me up the following morning. Friday, I awoke bright and early and brushed my teeth extra well. I wasn't going to let any elephant's tusks outshine mine. (laughs) Then I joined my landlady, Mrs. Davis, in the dinette. Why, Connie, it's only nine o'clock, and this is Armistice Day. There's no school. What are you doing up so early? I'm going on an elephant hunt, Mrs. Davis. Oh, that's nice, dear. Now, how do you want your toast? Buttered or... What did you say? (laughs) I said I'm going on an elephant hunt. In America? Of course. (laughs) I don't want to pry into your personal life, Connie, but why? Because Mr. Conklin wants one. Uh, 
Oh, I see. Well, if you'll just drink your juice now, I'll go in. Mr. Conklin wants an elephant. <laughs> For a mascot, Mrs. Davis. I guess he's trying to outshine Jason Brill's bear cub. Well, that should do it. If it's any kind of an elephant at all, it should. Where are you going to look for the beast, Connie? Down at Moore's Meadow. Beck Brothers Circus got stuck on their way to winter quarters. Equipment trouble or something. Anyway, they might be willing to rent us one of their performing elephants for the big game. Sounds logical. Who's driving you down, dear? He is. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Boynton. I left the door unlocked for him. Come in, Mr. Boynton. Well, I'll get some dishes and set another place for him. Hi, Miss Brooks. Walter, what are you doing here? Stretch told me all about the mascot last night, Miss Brooks. I think it's just about the most sensational idea ever, even if Mr. Conklin did get it. Here we are. Oh, hi, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Mr. Boynton. Uh huh? <laughs> it's me, Walter Denton. Oh, of course it is. I wasn't looking. Won't you have a snack with us, dear? Oh, sure I will. Thanks. Oh, what do you think of the new setup, Mrs. Davis? The Madison Mammoths. That's what the team will be called, of course. Mammoth? Sure. Because of the elephant mascot. You remember those prehistoric, hairy old elephants, don't you, Miss Brooks? Not personally. <laughs> oh, that must be Mr. Boynton now. Come in! I'll get another cup and saucer for you. Hello, Miss Brooks. Hi, Walter. Hello, Stress. Hi, pal. Pull up a chair. Here we are. Good morning, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> One more strike and you're out, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> it's Stretch Snodgrass. Oh, so it is. What can I get for you, dear? Would you like an egg? Well, I'm in training, Mrs. Davis. Oh, oh, I see. I'd like four eggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and how do you want them, Stretch? With ham and. With ham and what? Bacon. And if I could have some milk, too, please, and bread. What's the sense in renting one? We're raising our own elephant, right? <laughs> I'll get you boys what you want in a jiffy. Coffee's right on the buffet party. Thanks, Mrs. Davis. Come in. Morning, Miss Brooks. Hello, boys. Oh, hi, Mr. Boynton. Boynton. Sit down, Mr. Boynton. Have a cup of coffee while I tell you where I want you to take me this morning. Oh, thanks, Miss Brooks. I was rather curious about our destination. Yes? Well, we're going to pick up an elephant together. Oh, then we better not spend too much time sitting around and... <laughs> you say an elephant? That's right, Mr. B. Isn't it terrific? He's going to be our mascot. Can we go with you when you get him, Miss Brooks? Absolutely not, Stretch. The people that run the circus won't do any business with us at all if they think this is nothing but the childish scheme it is. I mean, Mr. Boynton and myself are going alone. Well, now, just a minute, Miss Brooks. Did Mr. Conklin actually say he wanted an elephant to be our mascot? Indubitably. Irrevocably. Yeah. <laughs> This beats everything. I've heard of some pretty strange mascots in my time. In fact, when I was coaching at State Normal, we had a guinea pig. The little fella grew, grew quite attached to me, too. He used to curl up in my lap all the time. Oh, but he looked real cute. <laughs> Matter of fact, he did. You, you know, most animals will lie down in your lap once they grow attached to you. That's fine, Mr. Boynton. With a little luck, maybe our new mascot will grow attached to Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Finish your coffee. We're off to the circus grounds. There's nothing quite as deserted as an empty circus lot, is there, Miss Brooks? I've always thought any empty lot was pretty deserted. <laughs> this one is rather grim, though. Nothing left but a few broken-down animal cages and some rusty equipment. Well, here's the administration car, Miss Brooks. Beck Brothers, private. Well, that must be the office. Well, as they used to say before television, let's go in. <laughs> Come in. Good morning, gentlemen. My name's Boynton, and this is Miss Brooks. How do you do? Beck is the name. Mike Beck. Beck is the name. Dan Beck. <laughs> you must be the Beck brothers. Give that man a box of bazooka bubble gum. <laughs> We'll come right to the point, gentlemen. You see, we're teachers at Madison High School, and our principal wants us to procure a mascot for our football team. Sounds like a nice idea. Very nice idea. <laughs> we furnished a mascot to Mr. Brill of Clay City High just the other day. Nice little bear it was. Very nice little bear. <laughs> Thank you, little Sir Echo, but I... <laughs> 
course, most of our animals, as well as the performers and circus personnel, have already entrained for winter quarters in Florida. But you do have some animals still on the grounds, don't you? Well, what kind did you want? Uh, we want an elephant. An elephant? <laughs> but we, uh, we just have one elephant left. To some people, that seems like a lot. <laughs> Would you be willing to rent it out for a while? Rent it out? Well, frankly, we never thought about doing anything like that. No, we never thought of doing anything like that. <laughs> we'd, uh, we'd take very good care of the animal. Very good care of the animal. <laughs> now, I'm doing it. Look, your season is over, and you don't need the elephant to perform today. Oh, Freddy couldn't perform today anyway. Freddy? Yes. Yes, that's why we kept him behind with us. He met with a little accident a few weeks ago. Yeah. We might as well tell him the truth, Dan. You see, folks, Freddy backed into the lion's cage, and, well, he sort of had his tail bitten off. <laughs> oh, that's a shame. Yes, now he can't make a circle with the other elephants. <laughs> But he's perfectly all right in every other way. You make a fine mascot for your team, Miss Brooks, and we wouldn't charge any rental fee at all. Well, the price is certainly right, but why are you doing this? Well, to save money on the elephant's feed bill. He's a good a eater, Freddy is. <laughs> I'll bet he eats like a horse. Hmm? <laughs> but, Mr. Beck, how do we get Freddy into town? And when do you want him back? Just walk him in behind your car. <laughs> and we'd like him back next April. Next April? Provided, of course, that you promise to take good care of him. You see, we're leaving tonight. Oh, but we just wanted a mascot for the Clay City game. Wait a minute, Mr. Boynton. Maybe Mr. Conklin would keep him for the rest of the season. Freddie could be mascot for other things besides football. But, Miss Brooks, an elephant. Uh, could I use your phone, please? Certainly, right here. Thanks. We'll leave it up to Mr. Conklin. It was his idea in the first place, and... Hello? And he said... Miss Brooks, I presume. How did you know, Mr. Conklin? I was taking my afternoon nap. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Conklin, but about the elephant... Didn't you get that elephant yet? I'm about to get it right now, sir, but, well, you'll have to keep this one longer I than... promise you, Miss Brooks, my wife will be very careful of this one. Now, I'd like to get back to sleep, if you don't mind. The kids in this neighborhood have kept me up half the day already. Yes, sir. Oh, Mr. Conklin, before you hang up, where shall I bring it? Bring it? Bring it to my house, of course. <laughs> now, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Mr. Beck? Yes? Got a hunk of rope? Well, <laughs> here's Mr. Conklin's house, Miss Brooks. Good. You better tie Freddy up to the front porch, and I'll go in and tell him we're here. Better take him over the side so he doesn't tie up traffic. All right, Miss Brooks. Come on, Freddy. This way, Freddy. Go on, Freddy. <laughs> on the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishes play, and the dawn comes up like thunder. Well, let's have the rest of the concert indoors, shall we? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Conklin. Step into the living room, please. Of course. Now then, Miss Brooks, did you bring it? Yes, sir. It's right outside. Outside? <laughs> Why didn't you bring it in? Mr. Conklin, I know you've been rather harassed recently, but we've got to get a few things settled immediately. First of all, where are you going to keep it? Right next to those books on the piano. <laughs> huh? Osgood, I'm afraid I... Ha oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. I was about to tell you, dear, that I have some disappointing news. There's nothing caught in that snare you set by the porch last night. Oh, oh, unhappy. <laughs> I was planning to use that gopher as our mascot this afternoon. Gopher? You want a gopher for a mascot? What did you think I wanted, an elephant? <laughs> oh, that, that reminds me, Miss Brooks. Did you pick up the elephant bookend that we wanted replaced? Elephant bookend? You received my note yesterday, didn't you? Some of it. I mean, apparently there was something not quite clear, Mr. Conklin. It was Conklin. perfectly I, clear, I... Miss Brooks. Allow me to recall it for you verbatim. It said, quote, Attention, comma, Miss Brooks, dash, I want you to purchase at once an elephant bookend of the type you admired so much at our house recently, period, unquote. 
Well? Oh, brother, exclamation point. <laughs> oh, listen to those kids, Martha. If we don't move out of this neighborhood soon, my blood pressure will now, just... please, dear, calm yourself. The children are just playing. Well, I'm going to the window and stop them. No! I, won't have them... I mean, you mustn't go to the window now, Mr. Conklin. Somebody might throw something, a ball or something. But that shouting and racket is Oh, got... it isn't really so bad. You're just overwrought. Of course, dear. In your nervous state, you exaggerate all irritation. <laughs> Was there? <laughs> what? It's an earthquake! Quick! Quick, let's get out of here! No, Mr. Conklin, you mustn't go outside. I'm not going to be trapped in here like a rat. Come on! Mr. Conklin, things will be nice and quiet in a few minutes. Freddie is moving us to a dead-end street. Eve Arden, as our Miss Brooks, returns in just a moment. But first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight... Yes, tonight, show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a Luster Cream shampoo. Luster Cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumit's magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster Cream shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, Luster Cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a Luster Cream shampoo. So gentle, Luster Cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try Luster Cream shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful Luster Cream girl. You owe your crowning glory to a Luster Cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, Mr. Conklin stormed off to the football game after warning us not to bring Freddie near the stadium. This left just a cozy little group consisting of Freddie, myself, and a rather haggard-looking Mr. Boynton. Well, this is terrible, Miss Brooks. With Mr. Conklin refusing to accept any responsibility in this matter, we're, we're in something of a predicament. How do you mean, Mr. Boynton? We'll just take Freddie back to the Beck brothers. You forget, Miss Brooks. By now, they're on their way to their winter quarters in Florida. Where in the world is Freddie going to sleep tonight? Maybe we could get him a room at the Y. Please, Miss Brooks, be serious. All right. How big is your place? <laughs> this, this pachyderm has to be fed and sheltered. Calm down, Mr. Boynton. I think I have the solution. We'll simply return Freddy to his winter quarters. Oh, but, Miss Brooks, who can afford a train ticket for a creature this size? Train ticket, nothing. We'll just point him south and give him a shove. An elephant never forgets. <laughs> Week, turn into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Men, do you shave with a lather or brushless shave cream? Plum Olive Shaving Cream comes both ways, and whichever way you prefer to shave, you'll find that using either Palm Olive Brushless or Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream can bring you more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Here's the proof. 2,548 men tried the new Palm Olive way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they had shaved before, three out of every four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Get Palm Olive Brushless or Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream today. <laughs> Did you know that the hotel business, now observing National Hotel Week, is the seventh largest industry in America? What's more, they're constantly working to further add to your convenience and comfort. In short, complete modernization of your home away from home. Remember, the hotels are America's hospitality industry. Be with us again next week at this same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay and Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair bring you Our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks written by Al Lewis. Well, most of us have our good days and our bad days. And our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, is no exception to this rule. They say there are days when it doesn't pay you to get out of bed. Well, last Friday, when my rent was due, was just such a day for my landlady, Mrs. Davis. I brought the subject up as soon as we had started to eat breakfast. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Davis, but I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. It's about the rent. You mean last month's rent? You haven't got it yet. I mean, this month's rent, I haven't got it again. <laughs> well, don't worry about it, dear. How does that old joke go again? There's no sense in both of us worrying. <laughs> what am I laughing about? I'm broker than you are. <laughs> Maybe so, Mrs. Davis, but you don't owe you as much as I do. But all hope isn't lost, though. I found out this week that I still have a chance to become head of Madison's English department. Really? Yes. In fact, I'm supposed to have a meeting with Mr. Stone of the Board of Education this morning. Where, Connie? In the office of our beloved principal, Mr. Conklin. I see. Do you think Mr. Conklin will put in a word for you? That's why I want to get there early. I think I know the word. <laughs> Actually, though, I'm, I'm not too worried about Mr. Conklin's attitude toward my teaching ability. Is it up to Mr. Stone to make the recommendation for Madison's new head of the English department? Yes, it is. And I understand that he won't recommend any promotions without a personal interview. That's why I asked Walter Denton to pick me up a little earlier this morning. He'll be here, Connie. And I know you'll get the position. I hope so, Mrs. Davis. You see, it isn't just the honor involved. It's the cash. The promotion carries a raise with it. Just think, I'll be able to pay you back the rent I owe, buy some new clothes, do my Christmas shopping, pick up a new winter coat, maybe even put a down payment on a car. Oh, that's wonderful, Connie. How much of a raise goes with this job? Two dollars a month. <laughs> or maybe it's two dollars a week. Come to think of it, I might have to wait a while for the car. <laughs> well, I'm very excited for you, Connie. I only wish we could celebrate with a little more luxurious breakfast. Toast and marmalade isn't very gala. Oh, I don't and know. And there's I... not much of that, I'm sorry to say. I tried to call the market this morning, but our party line was in use. In fact, it's almost always in use. Yes, I know. It's Every some time... woman named Grace, and <laughs> she's always talking to a friend of hers named Bertha. It's so frustrating sometimes when you want to make a call, and every time you pick up the phone, someone's talking. I know, I and try to get in there. <laughs> the things they were talking about were of any importance. They just go on and on and on and on. Mrs. Davis, they I They never really... give anybody a chance. <laughs> You'd think they'd get the idea, though, after hearing my receiver click a few times. Mrs. Davis, but I would no, like to say... no, no. <laughs> they just go on chattering about nothing. Yuckata, yuckata, yuckata. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes I could Mrs. Just... Davis. Yes, Connie. Deposit five cents for another three minutes, please. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dear. I guess I got carried away. Mm -hmm. Have some more coffee. Thanks, I will. Here's my cup. I wonder what's keeping Walter Denton. My interview with Mr. Stone's at nine sharp. Well, it isn't 8.30 yet, Connie. But if it'll make you feel any better, why don't you give Walter a ring? Good idea. Excuse me. Believe me, Bertha, I'm not petty. But when Elsie pulled that stuff on me about the tickets, I just had to open up my yap and let her have it. It's the party line again. Wouldn't you know it? Just when I have to make a quick call. I'll count ten and try again. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve, even fifteen dollars would be all right. <laughs> Oh, this is awful. Now, take it easy, Connie. I'm sure Walter will get you to school in plenty of time for your appointment. Now, I'm going to wash the dishes, dear. Why don't you put your hat and coat on and be all ready to leave? All right, Mrs. Davis, but first I'm going to try this phone once more. So I told her, Bertha. Listen, Elsie, I said, it isn't like us and I don't want to do our full share, I said. We know this is a benefit performance and that it's a good cause, but we weren't born yesterday, I told her. One, two, three, four. I can't understand why Walter Denton isn't here yet, Connie. It's almost ten minutes to nine. Too late to take a bus. It was too late to take the bus half an hour ago. I'd take a cab if I had the money. Or if you had the money. Have you, Mrs. Davis? Don't bother answering. I can tell by your face. Of course, it only takes ten minutes to drive to school the way Walter drives, but if he doesn't show up within a minute or two, I'd better call Mr. Conklin and tell him I'll be a little late. Then when I'm all ready to forgive and forget, Bertha, what do you think Elsie has the nerve to say to me? Will you please stop talking for just a minute? Exactly, Bertha. Will you please... <laughs> You answer the front door, Connie. I'm stacking the dishes. All right, Mrs. Davis. Hang on a minute, will you, Bertha? I think I hear my doorbell ringing. Oh. It's not your doorbell that's ringing. It's... Oh, what's the use? Well, it's about time. Oh, it's Harriet Conklin. Come in, Harriet. Thanks, Miss Brooks. Well, what are you doing at home, Miss Brooks? You should be on your way to school by now. So should you, Harriet. I know it, but Daddy left the house early this morning and asked me to be sure and see that you got to school on time. So I called Walter Denton, and he said he'd pick me up on his way over to school to pick you up. But then he called back and said his car had broken down, and he had to walk to school, and when he tried to phone you, all he kept getting was a busy signal. So I took the bus over here to tell you, and now we're both going to be late, and Daddy will have our scalp because Mr. Stone is waiting to see you, too. If that sentence doesn't win this year's Nobel Prize for Literature, you've been cheated. <laughs> Please, Miss Brooks, you've got to call Daddy right away. I've tried to, Harriet, but we've got a party line and their phone's been in use all morning. That's why Walter got a busy signal when he called. But I'll give it another whirl. So we took the tickets, Bertha. After all, why be small for the sake of a few dollars? If Elsie wants to be that way, that's her business. Great Gibble is different. Even if this weren't raffling off at you, Hudson, I'd rather be open in a bug board than do anything else. Except talk. Oh, hang on a few minutes, will you, Bertha? I have to put up my pot roast now. Gus likes it at least once a week. Tonight's the night. Hang on. Just a minute. Please don't go away. I... Who's going away? I'll just sit and drink a Coke till you get the meat on, Grace. <laughs> Fine, honey. This way we'll keep the connection open between us. I'm on a party line, you know. And boy, can those people who share this phone with us shoot the breeze. I'll just be a gif, dear. Okay, girl. Uh, I'll say, before you go, I'll give you a little tip. Have you got any bay leaves home? Yeah. You got a lot of bay leaves home? Yeah. Well, stick them in your mouth and jump in the stove with the pot roast. <laughs> Come in. It's me, Mr. Conklin, Miss Brooks. Well... Nice of you to drop in on us, Miss Brooks. Just happened to be in the neighborhood, did you? I know I'm late, Mr. Conklin, you but I... You had a nine o'clock appointment in this office with Mr. Stone. Do you know what time it is now, Miss Brooks? After 9.30? Yes, it is after 9.30. It's 10.40! <laughs> Please, Mr. Conklin... I can explain if you'll just let me. It's too I... late for explanations. Mr. Stone has left. But he'll be back, won't he? He hasn't decided on anyone else. Fortunately for you, Miss Brooks, Mr. Stone happens to be an extremely fair-minded individual. He's leaving for the state capitol at 7 o'clock this evening, but has promised to call you on the phone between 6 and 6.30. On the phone? Yes. <laughs> Confidentially, Miss Brooks, in spite of the steady stream of irritants with which you pepper my otherwise prosaic life, 
My integrity forced me to recommend you rather highly for this position. Oh, thank you, Mr. Conklin. I Now, do the important appreci- thing to Mr. Stone is the availability and cooperative spirit of the person he chooses. That is, if you're going to be head of a department, you'll probably want to know how accessible you can make yourself to the other teachers. He ought to talk to Mr. Boynton. I mean, uh... <laughs> it's, it's very nice of you to tell me all this, Mr. Conklin, but... If my getting this job depends on Mr. Stone reaching me on the phone tonight, I'm afraid I'm still out of the running. What do you mean? I'm on a party line that won't quit. They're constantly using the phone. He'll never get through to me. Then have your party line changed. Call the telephone company and tell them you want a different party line. What a wonderful suggestion, Mr. Conklin. I'll do it right after my last morning class. I'll call the phone company and ask for a new party line and a long cord. A long cord? What for? That's so if they don't give me the new party line, I can hang Grace and Bertha. (laughs) Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, will continue in just a moment. But first, here is Vern Smith. Now, proof that brushing teeth right after eating with Colgate Dental Cream helps stop tooth decay before it starts. Continuous research, hundreds of case histories, makes this the most conclusive proof in all dentifrice research on tooth decay. Eminent dental authorities supervised hundreds of college men and women for over two years. One group always brushed their teeth with Colgate right after eating. The other followed their usual dental care. The group using Colgate Dental Cream as directed, using Colgate's exclusively, showed a startling reduction in average number of cavities, far less tooth decay. The other group developed new cavities at a much higher rate. No other dentifrice offers proof of these results. Modern research indicates decay is caused by mouth acids, which are at their worst right after eating. Brushing teeth with Colgate's as directed helps remove acids before they harm enamel. Yes, Colgate's contains all the necessary ingredients, including an exclusive patented ingredient for effective daily dental care. So remember, always use Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Well, when lunchtime rolled around, I called the telephone company and was quite chagrined to learn that they couldn't possibly change my party line by the same evening. So I determined to put into effect Plan X, which decoded meant Operation I'll Face the People and Ask Them to Keep Off the Line from 6 to 6.30. I told Walter Denton about my scheme when I ran into him in the school cafeteria. I can't tell you all the details, Walter, but it's absolutely essential that my phone is clear this evening. And there's only one way I can accomplish it. Will you help me? Now, as always, Miss Brooks, my sword, my heart, and my life are dedicated to your service. (laughs) Thanks, Walter. Now, pick up your jacket. I can step over that puddle of chicken broth. (laughs) Sit down here a minute, Walter, and I'll tell you what I'd like you to do for me. Okay, Miss Brooks. First of all, I looked up the address of my party line playmate, Grace Gribble, and I found out that it's quite a distance from my place. Hence, I'd appreciate a lift. Well, I'd be happy to supply the lift, Miss Brooks, but alas, my chariot is at present reposing endurance vile. Endurance vile? I loused up the carburetor. (laughs) I mean, the car's being repaired, Miss Brooks, and that's why I couldn't get you this morning. I hope you've forgiven me for that unseeming lapse. What did you have for lunch today? A Shakespeare burger? (laughs) Look, Walter, what's wrong with the car? Oh, I broke a little wire that's attached to the carburetor. Well, it shouldn't take too long to have another wire put in. No, but when the wire broke, it got tangled up in the fan belt and ripped it to pieces. And then all you need is a new wire and a fan belt. Uh, Not exactly. You see, when the fan belt hit the fan, it flew out of its socket. Then you need a new fan, too. Then when the fan flew into the radiator, the water (laughs) poured into the distributor and ruined it and the spark plugs. So all we need is a new fan belt, fan, radiator, distributor, and spark plugs. And a new sign by the trolley tracks around the corner. A new sign? That's what I smacked into when I busted that little wire. (laughs) I promised the officer I'd replace the sign. What did the sign say, Walter? Safety zone. (laughs) 
If I knew jujitsu, you'd be lying across that steam table by now. Look, I've got to get out to 145 Collier Drive today, Walter. That's where the Gribbles live. Have you any suggestions? Oh, sure. Now, I happen to know that Mr. Boynton just got his car all fixed up. I was in the repair shop when he paid his bill. Mr. Boynton? That's right. So, oh, why don't you ask him to drive you this afternoon? This way, you will not only get to your destination promptly, but both you and Mr. Boynton will be in the company of people who obviously mean much more to each other than shows on the surface so far. Kill me, I love this type of boy. <laughs> Come in. Well, it's Miss Brooks. Come in. Thanks, Mr. Boynton. I'm glad I caught you before you left for the day. Oh, I was just tidying up the lab a bit. I've had quite a job cleaning my Bunsen burner. Oh, dirty flame? <laughs> Something seems to be stuck here. Up I... There, there, it's out. Now, now, what can I do for you, Miss Brooks? You can drive me out to Collier Avenue, Mr. Boynton, if you've got the time. You see, I'm expecting an important call from Mr. Stone around 6 this evening, and I've got to talk to the people who share the party line on my telephone. Oh, do you know them, Miss Brooks? Not personally, but they use the phone almost incessantly, and Mr. Stone wants to talk to me about my qualifications to head the English department. I just want to ask them to leave it free between 6 and 6.30. Oh, I see. Well, I'd certainly like to help you out, Miss Brooks, but frankly, I'm on a budget. I don't want you to buy me these people. <laughs> I just want a lift to their house. Uh, you don't understand. Collier Avenue is quite a way out, and I've had to limit my gas consumption. As I told you last night on the phone, if we go for a ride tonight through the park, I won't be able to use the car again until Monday. But this is very important, Mr. Boynton. I just... So is self-discipline, Miss Brooks. It isn't just the money involved. Although I find by purchasing only three gallons a week instead of four, I save 83 cents a month. <laughs> Which, when you add it up in, in a few years, it comes to a pretty penny. Believe me, Mr. Boynton, saving a pretty penny may be fun, but you can also get a kick out of spending an occasional ugly quarter. <laughs> if it's just a question of gas rationing, suppose I replace whatever gas is used up. Please, Miss Brooks, are you suggesting that I take money from a woman? No, gas. <laughs> No, no, it's out of the question. All right, then I'll let you pay for it. Well, that's not the solution either. It, it's a matter of principle with me. If I throw my budget out the window this time, I'll be tempted to do it again. A thing like that can become habit-forming. Don't you see, Miss Brooks, spending money is a disease. Well, don't make out your will yet. You'll never catch it. <laughs> Gee, Miss Brooks, you, you make me feel as if you think I'm cheap. Oh, not at all, Mr. Boynton. You're a very ready man with a budget. But don't worry about it. I'll get out there some way. I've still got my good right thumb and a pair of uncomfortable old shoes on my aching feet. <laughs> Miss Brooks. Yes, Mr. Boynton? I've just been stalling. I'm flat broke. Welcome aboard. <laughs> you see, the truth of the matter is I spent my last six dollars getting the car repaired and I just haven't enough money to, to put any gas in this afternoon. But I'll tell you what, I'll borrow a couple of dollars from one of the other teachers. Now, don't you worry, I'll get you out there some way. If I've said it once, I've heard it a thousand times. There's no sense in both of us worrying. <laughs> well, here we are, Miss Brooks, 145 Collier Avenue. If you don't mind, I'll wait out here in the car while you talk to the Gribbles. All right, Mr. Boynton. I'll just be a few minutes. Yeah, come on. Oh, yes, ma'am. Mr. Gribble? Yes, ma'am. I'm Miss Brooks. I share the party line on your telephone with you. There's something I'd like to speak to you and Mrs. Gribble about. Oh, well, come in, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Sit right down here in the living room. Thank you. My wife will be out in a minute. She's on the telephone. <laughs> Naturally. I beg your pardon? Nothing, Mr. Gribble. You see, the reason I dropped over is to ask a little favor. I've always tried to be a good party line neighbor. Oh, so have we, Miss Brooks. I don't see any reason why people on a party line should get into hassles, do you? Well, I it... believe if you just respect one another's privacy, everything will work out fine. Well, the minute we pick up the receiver, if we hear another voice, or somebody dialing, we hang right up. 
That's fine, Mr. Gribble. So do I, but <laughs> Mrs. Gribble is on the phone quite a bit, and tonight I'm expecting a terribly important call between 6 and 6.30, and I wonder if you could sort of keep off your phone until I've talked to my party. Oh, I don't see why we can't work something out. I'll talk to Grace about it right now. Pardon me just one minute. You know how Elsie is, Bertha. Some people you just can't reason hey, with. Grace, Grace, come here, man. I'm talking, Gus. I told Elsie, let sleeping dogs lay there, why don't you? But do you think she'd listen? Hey, Grace, we got company. Tell Bertha you'll talk to her later company? on. Company? Listen, Bertha, hang on, will you? I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Who is it, Gus? It's the young lady who shares our party line, Grace. Come on in, I'll introduce you. Miss Brooks? This is my wife, Grace. How do you do? How do, Miss Brooks? I'm sorry if I disturbed your conversation. Oh, but that's I... all right. Bertha, don't mind hanging on. She waits for a half hour sometimes. She's very loyal that way. <laughs> Miss Brooks uh, wants to ask a favor, Grace, about the telephone. Well, what is it? Well, I'm expecting a terribly important call tonight, Mrs. Gribble, between 6 and 6.30. From Mr. Boynton? Mr. Boynton? <laughs> Why, no, but how, how did you... You and that Boynton. He ain't got much get up and go in him, has he? <laughs> well, please, Mrs. Gribble, You're I... set for your ride around the park tonight? <laughs> the park? Well, how did you know Last that... Last week it was the zoo. This week it's the park. Doesn't he ever take you any place that costs money? Listen, Mrs. Gribble, Mr. Boynton isn't cheap. It's just that he's a school teacher too, and, well, we enjoy going to the places we go to when we go to them. An English teacher should talk better. <laughs> Not alone, Gus. She's a little excited. Listen, Miss Brooks, I think you're a very considerate person. Believe me, when you offered to chip in for the movies last Wednesday night, when Boynton said he was a little short, it was very touching. I was so thrilled I almost hung up. <laughs> and I thought I was living alone well, That reminds me, how's Mrs. Davis? Mrs. Davis? That's some doctor she has When she called him up with that sore throat last Monday It didn't take 20 minutes and he was phoning his exchange from your place I haven't seen Mrs. Davis since this morning, Mrs. Gribble Tell me, how is she feeling today? <laughs> oh, she's 100% better Good <laughs> Now, about the phone, I would like oh, to ask Oh, yeah, the you... phone Oh, i better get back to Bertha I want to tell her how good my pot roast turned out She was kidding me about it this morning Stick the bay leaves in my mouth, she says <laughs> Drop it again, Miss Brooks But, Mrs. Gribble, about tonight Mr. Gribble, I've just got to have a clear line on my phone this evening. Well, let's be honest, Miss Brooks. If you want a clear line on your phone ever, you better get another party to share it with. But I tried, Mr. Gribble. The phone company said they can't do anything about it right now. You didn't speak to the right people. My brother Bill works for the phone company. Bill Gribble. Yeah, talk to him. Tell him I sent you, and you'll get a new party line in a minute. Really, Mr. Gribble? Sure. Why, that's wonderful. But before I go, there's something else I'd like to ask you. Yes, ma'am? If you have a brother working at the telephone company, why can't you wangle yourself a private line? Well, confidentially, we like it better this way. <laughs> yeah, the party line's a great relaxation. You see, Miss Brooks, we haven't got a television set. <laughs> Mr. Gribble, you said you believe in respecting people's privacy. I do. Did you ever hear me join one of your personal conversations? <laughs> what time is it now, Mrs. Davis? 7.15, Connie. I can't understand why Mr. Stone didn't call. Did the phone company change your party line? Yes, from Madison 4587 to Madison 6319. Without Grace Gribble, it couldn't possibly have been busy from 6 to 6.30 inclusive. Maybe Mr. Conklin heard from Mr. Stone. I'll give him a ring. So I looked out the window, and there was this Mr. Boynton in the car. Bertha, he's a dream. Mrs. Gribble, what are you doing on this line? Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. The phone company told me I'd be sharing the line with a new number, Madison 6319. Madison 6319? 
Well, isn't that nice? That's Bertha's number. <laughs> oh, Grace. This is just dandy. What's dandy, Connie? Instead of having Grace, who's always talking to Bertha, I now have Bertha, who's always talking to Grace. <laughs> Eve Arden as our Miss Brooks returns in just a moment, but first... Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl. Tonight? Yes, tonight. Show him how much lovelier your hair can look after a luster cream shampoo. Luster cream, world's finest shampoo. No other shampoo in the world gives K. Dumas magic blend of secret ingredients plus gentle lanolin. Not a soap, not a liquid. Luster Cream Shampoo leaves hair three ways lovelier. Fragrantly clean, free of loose dandruff, glistening with sheen, soft, manageable. Even in hardest water, Luster Cream lathers instantly. No special rinse needed after a Luster Cream Shampoo. So gentle, Luster Cream is wonderful even for children's hair. Tonight, yes, tonight, try Luster Cream Shampoo. Dream girl, dream girl, beautiful luster cream girl, you owe your crowning glory to a luster cream shampoo. And now, once again, here is our Miss Brooks. Well, I was feeling pretty low about missing Mr. Stone's call, and I told Mr. Boynton as much when he phoned me at 8 o'clock. Oh, don't worry about it, Miss Brooks. I'm sure Mr. Stone will be back in town soon, and you can have your interview with him then. Now, suppose you cheer up, and we'll go to a movie. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I... come on, Miss Brooks. I borrowed enough to show us a real nice time. But I don't really feel like a movie. Please, Miss Brooks. Come on, Miss Brooks. Say yes. <laughs> Who was that? That's my party line neighbor, Bertha. Bertha, Mr. Boynton. Mr. Boynton, Bertha. Uh, how do you do? Talk more, Mr. Boynton. I'm crazy about your voice. <laughs> uh, I don't understand. Who is this? This, Mr. Boynton, is Madison 6319. That's right, Mr. Boynton. What's your number? <laughs> He's a restricted number. We don't give him out. <laughs> now, <clears throat> about that movie, Mr. Boynton, on second thought, I'll be happy to go with you. Please, Bertha, hang up. What movie did you have in mind, Mr. Boynton? Well, any number can play. So why can't I go along? <laughs> Sorry, Bertha. Any number can play is only on the screen. In the balcony, it's strictly one to a customer. Next week, tune into another Our Miss Brooks show brought to you by Luster Cream Shampoo for soft, glamorous, caressable hair and Colgate Dental Cream to clean your breath while you clean your teeth and help stop tooth decay. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, is produced by Larry Burns, directed by Al Lewis, with music by Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Boynton is played by Jeff Chandler, Mr. Conklin by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Gloria McMillan, Joseph Kearns, Lucille Meredith, and Sandra Gould. Men, here is actual factual proof of more comfortable, actually smoother shaves by using Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream. 1,251 men tried the Palm Olive Lather way to shave described on the tube. And no matter how they shaved before, three out of four got more comfortable, actually smoother shaves. Try Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream. See if you don't get more comfortable, actually smoother shaves the Palm Olive Lather Shaving Cream way. <laughs> Most of our schools remain understaffed, overcrowded, handicapped by buildings and equipment of inferior quality. And all of these conditions undermine the morale of teachers, teachers in whose keeping rests the future of the rising generations of American citizens. There is a continuing shortage of teachers themselves, reflecting the fact that educational crisis is still with us. You can help by taking an active part yourself in parent-teachers organizations and local educational groups. Remember, our teachers mold our nation's future, and in that future, you have a vital stake. 
For mystery liberally sprinkled with laughs, listen to Mr. and Mrs. North Tuesday evening over most of these same stations. And be with us again next week at the same time for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Bob Lamont speaking. This is CBS for Columbia Broadcasting.